and turn up or switch it to flying to the Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what an octopus, a knife, geese, and a printing machine have in common? Today, Charles Mitchell will be given be given by William Menarty, which will explain the philosophy, history, and the world history of many English words. Julian has extensive experience in the class teaching subjects such as French, Spanish, history, and special education, special education in British Columbia, Canada. <clears throat> now he teaches English at Joseon University in Gwangju. Now the speaker will give us her eight grades and ten gifts, the real origin of the word you saw so you knew. Let's welcome Julian with a big crowd of loud applause. Welcome. I'm Julian. Well, actually, I'm his avatar. Julian is getting coffee, so I'm filling in for him. Have you ever been to Starbucks on a Saturday? Eesh. Anyway, GIC apologizes for the delay. His presentation today is entitled, Eight Grapes and Ten Geese, Things You Thought You Knew About English. So, how are you today? Did you have lunch? I hope so. This is a long presentation, you know. Okay, anywho. Aha. Uh -huh. That's funny <laughs> because Julian's Canadian. You <laughs> Coffee, so I thought I would make a video telling you I want a coffee. Um, okay. Um, so as you know, this is we're going to talk a little bit about where words in English come from and why we say some crazy, stupid things in English. And you you figure out a rule, and then something is very strange, and you can't figure out why English has all these crazy exceptions and, and things like that. And the truth of the matter is. English itself isn't really its own language. It's a mix, and we're going to talk about this. But before we talk about that, I think it's important that as human beings, we ponder, where do we come from? Where do we come from? Oh, this is the Milky Way, by the way. This is our galaxy. And uh, I think, uh, maybe, uh, what do you want to say? Uh, we're about uh, Yogyo. We're right about here, I think. Yes, we're right about there. And uh, why is this important? Well, let's start with something simple. Or is it? How do we get our names? Well, English and many other languages, and Korean to a certain um, uh, extent, uses a naming convention to give people their names. Uh, one is called patronym or patron uh, patrilineal, so we get our names from our fathers. Uh, another example is location. And the third example is description. So how would that work? Well, if I were Russian, my name wouldn't be Julian McNulty, it would be Julian Alanoff. My father's name is Alan. So, my last name would be of Alan, Alanoff. So I would be Julian Alanoff. And if you're Russian, you might want to have a friendly conversation. My name wouldn't be Julian, it would be Masha. So it'd be, hey, Masha Alanoff would be my name. So I have a girl's name. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's one example of your father. Um, take the Danes, for example, Danish people. They have their father. <coughs> their son, and the grandson. So let's take the name like, um, oh, let's think of a good, uh, Olaf. Olaf's a good name. Uh, and Gunther. So Gunther is the father, and Olaf is the son. Well, the son doesn't take the father's name. He takes the grandfather's name. So he's not going to be Olaf Gunther's son, or he's not going to be Olaf whatever his father's name. He's going to be whatever his grandfather's name is. So he's going to be Olaf, pretend his grandfather's Gunther, Olaf Guntherson. And his son is going to be Gunther Olafsson. And his son is going to be Gunther Olafsson, Olaf Guntherson. 
Gunter Olafsson, and they switch back and forth. So you can see in Danish society, father, son, grandson, father, son, grandson, all the way down the list. Um, that's an example of patronymy. How about location? Uh, let's think of a good uh, example. Um, in English, uh, we might name somebody, uh, oh, actually, let's think of Korean. When you meet a foreigner, what's the first thing you say when you meet a foreigner in Korea? What's the first thing that comes out in conversation? Say again. Where are you from? Where are you from? Well, I'm from that mountain over there. <laughs> oh, you're from Murum San. Well, I will call you Murum, or I will call you San. So now your last name becomes San. That would be an example in English. A famous hockey player, his name is Peter Forsberg. We're going to go with the Swedes again. Fors and Berg. Fors and Berg. Mountain, Fors. Berg, water. No, I said it later on. Berg is mountain, Fors is fork in the water. So back in the old days, I'm going to put on my really bad Swedish accent. Hello, how are you? Where are you from? No. I'm from the fork in the river by the mountain. Oh, I'll call you Forsberg. Your name is Forsberg. What was your father's name? Peter. Ah, you are Peter Forsberg. So, the names stick geography. We have names like Hill. I'm from the hill. Uh, rivers. There are people named rivers. Uh, you might have uh, other names. Um, not yet city. You don't have somebody whose last name is City. My name is Joe City. I'm from New York. Doesn't happen. But geographical features. People will name their self after geographical features. Forest. Where are you from? The forest. Um, trees. So maybe you meet somebody and their last name is Namu. <laughs> maybe. Or Nabi. I don't know. Nabi Nabu. Okay. Um, that's an example of location, where you could be from, could indicate. Uh, and if you're an alien, maybe your last name is Star. Something. I'm from Mars. Oh, your last name is Mars. Okay. Uh, description. Uh, this is also interesting and often uh, mixes with location. Uh, the Czechs, for example, have a word for somebody. Let's say, um, so here's Peter Forsberg and Benny Hill. And they're standing together, and a new guy comes in, and they say, where are you from? And he says, oh, well, I'm from the hill over there. Ah, Benny's from the hill. No, no, you can't be hill. Well, actually, I'm from the fork in the river by the mountain. No, no, that's Peter. Choose a new name. Well, um, I don't know. Uh, your, your hill, your river, um, Maybe, uh, I don't know, what should I be? Well, you're the new guy. You're the new guy. Ha! He's the new guy. And in Czech, new guy is Nedved. Nedved, newcomer. Wigukin. Nedved. You're the new guy. So, hey, new guy. Your name is Nedved. Example. Um, another example. Am I? How? What do you notice about me? Don't say handsome or ugly. So I'm very short, right? Am I short? <laughs> right? Am I, well, I'm probably tall or small, so that's one way of calling people by their names. So, oh, you're very tall. Your new name is tall or giant or gigantor. Short people, small, right? Little. Now it comes from, oh, you look at the little lad. Little is also patronymial, so you could have a man whose name is John and his son, Little John. Uh, also, ironic, uh, so we make contradiction. Uh, very often in English, somebody's name is Little, he's not Little, he's very big. Um, you think of Robin Hood, uh, Little John, not Little, okay? Big Bill, sometimes he's small. So the names can, can change, physical features. Uh, uh, what are we talking about? Smith. Uh, also, description of job. What do you do? Well, my name is Bill, and I make shoes for horses. That's what I do. Ching, ching, ching. Ah, you are a blacksmith or a horsesmith. So, your name is Bill Smith. Okay. 
uh, blacksmith. Black or smith or blacksmith. And they just, they go, cut it in half. You're black, you're a smith. Ooh, maybe I'm from Africa, and they call me black. But back in the day, black didn't mean Africa. Black could mean blacksmith or just, you're darker than me. I'm, I'm from Sweden. No sunlight. Oh, very white. Ghost. <coughs> yeah. You are very tan. You are from Spain. Oh, you're black. Okay, so black, white, black, white, black, white. Oh, you're from Norway. Lots of snow. You're very white. White. Okay. Um, examples of description from names. Ah, oh, now let's talk about what's in the name. Let's talk about the Irish, shall we? Fitz, one of my favorites. Shh. Anyone Catholic here? Anyone Catholic? Okay, I'll teach you a little quasi-myth, quasi-truth about the name Fitz. Laser pointer Fitz. Fitz was given to somebody when they, uh, we talked about John Alanoff, Olaf Gunterson, Gunter Olafsson. Well, often a child's father would take the father's name. So um, John is the father, Bill is the son. So his name would be, you know, John of Bill. Okay? Or the other way around, sorry. Uh, Fitz was a way to keep track of people whose fathers were secret. So, for example, let's pretend my father is Prince Charles of England. I'm going to be king. Yeah? You know, William is this, I'm older than William. I'm going to be king. Yes? No, because my mother and Charles it was a secret. Shh. <coughs> so my secret is Charles is my father. So my name would be Julian. Fitz Charles, Fitz Charles. So it then adapted to, uh, so nobility, rich people often had wives and girlfriends <laughs> and more girlfriends and they kind of lost track of who was the father or so they would write down baby daddy, baby daddy Bill. So Fitz became son of usually a rich person, usually, is what it morphed into. But as time went on, the rich people started either just paying for the kids or saying, yeah, he's my child. But the people who couldn't do that were the Catholic priests. So I am Father Gerald, and I had a son with one of the nuns. And so my son's name is going to be Fitzgerald. That is one way Fitz was originally used. It meant son of usually a rich person or a Catholic priest. So, or another priest. Somebody who had to keep a secret. So if you see the name Fitz, down to the family history, there's a secret. <laughs> o is of again. Well, I am from Guangzhou. My name is Julian O. Guangzhou. <laughs> So, of Guangzhou, or O oh, Naju, <coughs> from Naju, yeah? O oh, Naju. Mick is son of, son of. Of, we talked about already, is the, um, is the Russian version of Mick, of. So, my father's name is Alan, Alanoff. His father's name was Francis, which would be Frankoff, I guess. So, my father would be Alan Frankoff, and I would be Julian Alanoff. So every generation gets a new last name. Standardization of the same last name didn't start till about two or three hundred years ago when they started taking formal records of names. So you would go to a family and say, okay, how many people in this house, Jim? Uh, five. Okay, who? Well, there's Gunter Olafsson, Olaf Gunterson, Bill Allenoff, Alan Biloff. Oh, yeah. Okay, one name. Give me one name. And we'll write that down. Oh, we are the Guntersons. Ah, okay, Guntersen. Olaf, you're Olaf Guntersen. Guter, you're Guter Guntersen. What? Yes, no more Olafsen. Everyone, same last name. Okay, so that was a focus. And oh, we talked about son. Interesting, the Danish don't say S O N, they say S S E N. But there's variations. Okay, I'm Irish, I say Mick. The Scottish say Mac. M-A-C. But some Scots say Mick. 
and some Irish say Mac. There's some mixing. So if you see Mick or Mac, good, good, good rule. Mick is Irish, Mac is Scottish. But again, there's the mixing. Okay. And what do we have next? Who do we So before we do that, I want you, with your partner next to you, to find your last name. You have a choice. You can use your father's name. You can use where you're from. You can use your job. Or you could use a physical feature. Now remember, if we all look the same, we all have dark hair or we all have glasses, it's pretty hard to have the same last name, right? So how would you change your last name? If everyone's last name is Kim, how do you know who's related? How do you know that? Do you pull out the book and go, hmm, Kim, 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 or McNulty? Well, we could go down the list. Lucky for me, there aren't very many where I'm from, so we're probably related. Go to Ireland, many not related. So how do you know who's your cousin, who's your brother, who's your second cousin, and who's not? So just as an exercise, give yourself a new last name, be it your father, be it your, uh, where you're from, your, a physical feature. Uh, I have no, no little finger, so my last name's gonna be Littlefinger. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna give you two minutes with a partner. Try to find a new last name for yourself. <laughs> Don't see what come up with. I like shoes. My new last name's gonna be Kudu. <laughs> So 
so I got got a couple here. Uh, what one was? Uh, can I um, uh, Kaylin's uh, uh, Kaylin. Kaylin. Kaylin's um, mother's maiden name is Aquaviva. Aquaviva, right? Which is Italian, and what does it mean? Living water. Living water. That's her actual last name. So. You don't need to pick one. I think that's a great last name. I think in Korean, you guys actually can you a lot of the, your 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 names themselves mean something. You know, like Bora or whatever. So Bora could be a last name in English. Oh, purple. Yeah, right on. Or Nabi. You know, my last name is Nabi. Butterfly. Mariposa would be the, the Spanish version of Nabi. Uh, there was another one. Uh, freckles. Freckles. Why not? Or uh, brown. Oh, you got a little brown spot there. And she's got a shirt on that says she picked a uh, dog, dog puppy leaf. She loves puppies. So maybe she works in a puppy mill. Oh, that could be your last name, Miller. Oh. Um, but uh, she likes puppies, so she merged it with her real last name, Puppy Leaf. But first time I see her, she's wearing a shirt that says Fitch. Guess what her new name is? I'm gonna call her Fitch. Um, all right, so let's go on from there. Let's talk a little bit about the history of where English actually come from. Well, we know way, way back when uh, there was this island called an island, and the um, uh, Romans invaded, occupied for a long time. But then when the Romans left, around 440 AD, so we're working on what? Oh, jeez, what's that like? 2000, 1000, 16, 1600 years ago? I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher. About 1600 years ago, uh, the, the Roman Empire fell. And as it was falling, all these uh, little tribes started fighting. And uh, this is what happened. And this garden party. And when all these tribes started fighting, they invited in these hordes of uh, mercenaries. And these mercenaries were called Fodorati. Fodorati. Sounds like Ferrari with something else. And they were Germanic goons. They were mercenaries for hire. And the, the, it started with the Roman emperor. As he was trying to leave, he was having trouble. So he wanted to keep the peace. By peace, I mean... You know, kill everyone else. So he went to Europe and he said, hey, why don't you guys come over here and beat up some of the locals for me? You know, beat them. Yeah, stay down. So they're like, yeah, we like a good fight. As you see, they like to do that thing. So you would never invite the Fodorati to a garden party. They were not nice people. Well, what did the Roman emperor forget, the Roman governor forget to do? He forgot to pay them. <laughs> so you got a bunch of violent men who like to hurt people and they certainly like to eat and drink and they like to get paid but now they have no money so what do you think they would do what would you do if you needed to get paid and you were really violent loot the village Loot the village. Well, it is no, loot, loot and pillage. Loot and pillage the village, and in this case, the entire island of England. Uh, by England, I mean the United Kingdom. The whole, the whole lot of it. And they came from an area that we would call Denmark now, and northern Germany and uh, uh, Holland or the Netherlands, and Germany. So the Saxons, the Angles, this is where we get the name Anglo-Saxon, Angles, Jutes, Frisians, they're Dutch, Franks, the Franks are kind of more towards the French area, they all said, they were all mercenaries, and they all said, oh, we're going to get our money, we don't get money, we'll take land, just as good, so they invaded, and they invaded, and they invaded, and then they invaded again, and this is what we have, is this Massive attack up into Northern England and the East of England, and this is why East England is called East Anglia and Northumbria, and you can definitely today still hear the difference in the accents. So up in the north, you got the Sunderlands and the Newcastle, well, they speak a little more like this, a little more Danish, Norse sounding, 
And in the East, they sound a little more German French. The French, that's the next chapter. So this is what happened. They fought and they fought and they fought. And finally, they kind of made a peace. And they, you know, the North, these were more the Danes. Now, the Danes back then, they're nice people now, right? Copenhagen, right on, you know, it's a cool place. I have some Danish friends, they're good sense of humor, happy-go-lucky. But back then, they were pretty mean people. And um, they just wanted England. I mean, the Greenland is the largest island in the world, if you don't include Australia, and if you don't believe it's actually three islands. Mm -hmm. So they like invading islands and taking big ones. So here's Canada with this thorn in the side called Greenland, which we can't call our own, because the Danes have it. So the Danes just invade, invade, invade. And so finally, they got held off here. In Wessex and Anglia, this became um, more uh, Saxons. Well, here's the interesting thing. When all this happened, there were only 12 words of original English that survived. 12 words. So pick your favorite 12 Korean words, Dutch words, whatever your favorite words are, put them in your pocket, and that's all you get to take with you a thousand years down the road. That's it. 12 words, that's what English began with, 12. Or should I say, restarted with. So you wonder why our language is messed up? We've only got 12 words. Um, the words we kept were geographical words, generally, or topographical. Words you probably have never used. Crag is one. Crag is a rocky outcrop. You see a cliff and a piece of rock. Crag, why did we keep that word? Well. The Frisians, they're from the Dutch, right? The Frisian, and Frisia. Frisians are right here, very low, 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 really low. And they are in boats, and the word boat came from the Frisians. But the Frisians come up over here and they see all these mountains, never seen mountains before. Don't know why they didn't go to the Alps, but they came here, mountains, like, what is that? We don't know what that is. And they ask the local, what's that? Eh, it's Craig. A what? Craig. Craig. <laughs> Craig. And the word survived. Twelve words survived. That's it. So the Picts and the Celts got kicked out pretty much right out of England and Scotland into the fringe areas. The fringe areas. Oh my god, don't talk about them. That'd be these guys over here, the Scots. I'm the Welsh. Oh, that's Ireland. The Welsh over here. <coughs> Ironically, the name Wales isn't even a Welsh word. It's a word from over here, and it comes from Valis, which means, direct translation to Korean, Wigwigin. So when you see somebody from Wales and you call them Welsh, you're actually calling them Wigwigin. In their own country, they're being called outsiders. Of course, if you talk to a Welshman, he'll never say, Oi, Welsh. He'll call himself, I can't even remember the name, but he will not say, I'm Welsh. He'll call himself by native to this land. So, um, ironic that what we think is Wales is a, the word means way we can learn. So, um, so uh, right around here, about 800, 880, uh, 880, so um, what am I going to call that? Palbeck uh, Palship. Uh, there's this dude here. Oh, yeah, I'll fix that for you, would ya? Oh, yeah. There's this dude here, and his name's Alfred. Alfred. And he makes a deal with the Angles and the Danes, and he says, I'll tell you what, you guys keep up here, we'll keep down here. Now he's English, considers himself English. But by the, 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 the Danes are still invading. Wing, 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 wing. What time is it? Time to invade England! Woohoo! Uh, what are you doing this weekend? I'm <laughs> going to England. Ah, yeah. <laughs> kept going and going 400 years. They kept coming and coming. So finally, Alfred said, I'll tell you what, you guys, you keep here, we, we'll keep down here. The Danes said, eh, okay, that's good enough. 400 years, we got our money back. So, um, and that he's the only English king who has the name The Great. The only one, because he saved England, or made England, depending how you look at it. So right around then was the first English writing. Beowulf is officially the first English 
the script, but it's arguable whether it's the actual first written English. It's the first one they found. And it wasn't even found in England. I think it was Iceland or the Faroe Islands they found it. And they looked at it. Oh. <laughs> Must be English. So, and that's old English. Old English. And we're going to get into that uh, a little later in a second. Okay, so there's, we talked about alpha grade. So, uh, we got a problem. We got a problem, and that's, uh, we got the Danes, and we got the, the Saxons, but uh, they got a mix, right? Because along the line, men and women always go together. <laughs> well, mostly. So, you know, the Chinese have the great character, how is man and woman together make happiness, right? So, um, this thing has to happen. So you got the Saxon lady over here, and you got the Norse dude over here from Denmark, and doesn't speak her language, she doesn't speak his language. So what do they do? How do they communicate? It's kind of a pigeon, much like how I communicate in Korean, I think. You know, show somebody, I don't know, we're, we're, we're no money, dang. So, you, they get it, they figure it out, and, and some of the words are common, some aren't. Um, a good example is uh, horse. Horse. Um, oh, maybe I'll see what the next one is going to be here. Yes, horse. Crosset. So there's horse, crossin, crosset, and the words all change depending whether it's hana, tul, all that good stuff. So it's one horse, meinen, einen, cross, and, uh, or, uh, yeah, horse. And then plural was cross it. So you switch the spelling. Oh man, this is confusing. So finally they said, you know what? Let's just make one ending. As I like to say, sorry, one ending. And that ending <laughs> is the letter S. So instead of books and beach, we have book and books. So we just said, oh, everything gets an S. That's how we solve that problem. Oh. Uh, Cross across an eeny, meeny, money, mo, horse. Let's make horse plural, S, horses. There we go. And some words got taken from the, Swede, uh, from the Saxons, and some got taken from the Danes, the, the Angles, and we made a language, kind of an intercommunication language. That definitely looks like somebody who needs a dentist. <laughs> Well, after that all got sorted out, finally we've got a kind of a unified language. People are at peace. This is now at the same time of, you know, King Arthur, right? All the kingdoms are unified and England is finally a country, right? Well, and then this guy comes along, William the Conqueror, William the Orange uh, from, uh, William, William the Conqueror from, 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 from this country called... Uh, no, um, vive la France! He's French. Yes, he's Norman. He's Norman. Yeah, he's French. And uh, so he comes in and he kills King Harold. Big battlefield, and Harold uh, gets one right through the eye. And uh, this, uh, what ends up happening? Uh, French takes over. French. So now English is now French. What? Yes. What the heck? We get over 10,000 words in English come from French. 10,000 from French. Give you an example. Um, the Danish or the, the Norse word for is cow, right? So we we'll use cow. Or as they said back then, cow. Cow is how they pronounce it back then. Cow. You can still hear it when you go to northern England. Cow. Cow. Well, you have cow, but the French, they don't say cow. They say boeuf. 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 Which is where we get beef. So why does he say, look, cow? And you say, oh, I'm eating beef. What, 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 why? Well, think of the king. The king is not going to go and kill the cow. He's going to sit there and go, huh, go kill me a cow, huh? And he's gonna say, yeah, mother to do a pretty boeuf, huh? Give me some boeuf. So he's speaking French. Everyone comes to him. Here's your cow. It's not cow. Boeuf. Boeuf. Say it with me. Boeuf. 
beef. Okay, there you go. Good enough. So they start eating beef. So everything as a rule that's close to the king is French. Everything far from the king, not French. So the farmers and the cow, oh, there's a pig. Pig, pig, oink, oink. And we call pig pork. Or ironically now, the French say cochon. But um, porc, P-O-R-C, porc, pork, P-O-R-K in English. Please don't confuse pork and fork. Although Alberta and Canada had an advertising campaign, put the pork on your fork. So I'm, if you see that, if you go to Canada, you're going to be like, put the pork on your pork. <laughs> okay. um, and then we have sheep, which we often call mutton, mouton, which comes from the French as well. So sheep, cow, pig come from the Norse. Incidentally, the monosyllabic swear words in English generally come from the Norse, the, the Vikings. So I'm not going to say them, but normally uh, the bodily functions, uh, fart, uh, 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 burp, um, uh, the other ones I'm not going to say, all, they come from those, langu uh, those language, those uh, languages. Uh, yeah, so that all came from the Norse. The French brought more civilized language. They think it's civilized. So that's that. So what, what we also did is we added layers of meaning to words. So we have words like pig and pork and beef and cow. Well, let's look at an example in Korean. Um, this is taken from Dachau. Uh, uh, it was a concentration camp in World War II. And Dachau, on its door, on its gates, had the words Arbeit macht which means work will set you free. Work will make you free. Arbeit macht frei. Work will make you free. It's a concentration camp. Well, who were friends? That's right, the Germans and the Japanese were friends for a while, weren't they? So the Japanese picked up the word and they made Arubaito. 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 Well, the Japanese came to Korea for a while, didn't they? And what did that word become? Arba. But it doesn't mean arbeit is in ilhada. It means part-time job. So it was a layered meaning. So you still have job and part-time job. But in Germany, if you say arbeit, it means ilhada. So you take the meaning and you put layer on it. Uh, English example, ask. Monosyllabic word, Vikings. S cow okay. All the other monosyllabic words come from the Norse, uh, the North North Europeans. So then we have to have other words. Um, so ask. And there's another word in English, demand. Demand. Well, in French, ask and demander. It's the same. Toca, same meaning. In French, uh, je vais te demander. I will ask you. But in English, if we say demand, is there a difference between I ask you, I demand you, or I demand, I ask? There's a difference. Demand is very strong! Shut up! Okay. Uh, as demand, or could you please be quiet while we listen to the safety demonstration aboard Korean Airlines Flight 465. <laughs> so there's a difference. Big difference. Arbeit. And Arbeit comes from the Germans. Ar Arbeit, yeah, and Arubait Tov comes from the Japanese, and it came to Korean as Arba. Mm -hmm. So we pick and choose our words sometimes, because work, you know, it's a good example. Well, there's 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 weekend work, there's work work, there's fun work, there's part time work, and then there's just work around the house. So you you think of meanings for each one and. The Koreans said, as did the Japanese, because the ar arubaito is part-time work in Japanese, said, well, you know what, let's just make it one part of the job. Okay, so all this happened, and the French came and they invaded, or they got, well, not got rid, but they layered on top of this new English language. But English survived. Why did English survive? Well, it survived because the working class was still English. And that means the nurses, you know, the people, we talk about the rich people, the Fitzes of the world having babies, the nurses were still English, which means the babies were not learning 
Hey, petit baby, t'as pas besoin de pleurer. They're learning, hush little baby, please don't cry. They're learning the English nursery rhymes. They're learning everything in English because the nursemaids are all English or speaking English, not the French. Oh, the French, that is for the English. They are very poor. We are rich. <laughs> so the English stayed. It stuck. And the grassroots, if you will, stayed English. There is still, as of, so this was 1066 till 1470s was still Norman in, in, in England. So um, that period still with French, but around the early 1400s, there are still, there's evidence that textbooks learning French was French as a second language, not as a first language. So mm, 300 years, 400 years after the invasion, they're still teaching French like a second language. So have no fear if you have trouble with English. It took the English 400 years to learn French. So I think coming English coming to Korean, to Korea, 20, 30 years is not a lot of time. So and it's like, oh, why can't I learn English? Uh, well, it took the English 400 years to learn French and the French invaded them. So um, lots of problems. And there, of course, the grassroots language was still English. So there's our friend, Mr. England. All right. Well, um, so what did English sound like back then? What did it sound like? Does it sound like it does today? Maybe not so much like, hey, dude, man, what's that? No. Sound, the vowels were different, for one. The, the consonants were harder. I'll give you an example. Um, let's pick an author. Anyone think of a famous author? Chaucer, there we go, thank you. Um, Chaucer, William, uh, 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 Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, now Chaucer, interesting. Uh, Latin, Greek, French, German, English. He could speak, read, write all those languages. Now, uh, did I say French? Um, but he chose to write in English. And uh, back then it would have sounded, Canterbury Tales, let's say, would have sounded something like this. Uh, Vandara providishori sotu, the drocht of March hath pierced to the rota, and bathed every vein in sweet liqueur, a wit vertu, engendred is the fluid. That would have been what it sounded like. What did I say? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it, the spring of March yeah, comes yeah. the flower comes in the rain. In the, the rain. rain. Yeah, the, the drought, <laughs> the drought, uh, the water, the, the flowers are watered. Vandara pro, when. April, Vandarapur yeah. Vinshore Sota, when it showers soak, yeah. they would uh, have Vandarapur uh, Vinshore Sota, the drought that much had passed, the drought that much had passed to the root, to the root. Yeah? Uh, so this is Chaucer up here, it kind of looks like this. Oh, there we go, I'm in pinpoint. He was actually a pretty cool dude, he was a, a pretty kind of cool guy. Um, I'm going to talk about him for a second here. A lot of uh, rules in English, grammar rules, come from uh, one person, one single person. And his name is Robert Loewe. Ironic, because I loathe Robert Loewe. Um, L-O-W-T-H-E. Uh, he sat down around the same time as uh, Johnson did when he wrote the first dictionary. And he said, to come up with a set of rules for English. Everything's different. Let's make a set of rules. So Loth said, okay, this is rule one, rule two, rule three, rule four. Uh, one rule that he came up with was um, no split infinitives, which we now call the Star Trek rule. I didn't put the video up here, but um, that rule changed as late as the 1960s. Um, but you could not say to boldly go. My grandfather would rule over in his grave, in fact, yelled at me many times for splitting an infinitive. To adverb, verb. To mm, excitedly yell. To hurriedly run. You can't say that in English. You couldn't say that in English. Language changes. That was one rule. Another rule, no double negatives. There's a good one. Man, I ain't got no money. I ain't got no money. Araceo, do you understand what that means? What does that mean? I have no money. I have no money, right. We are supposed to believe it means we, I don't, I have money, but 
I say I ain't got no money. You understand that to mean I, I don't have money. Well, the French use double negatives. The Spanish use double negatives. It's part of the language. English just decided. Robert Lowe said, oh, right, no double negatives for English. But if I say, yo, man, I ain't got no money. I'm really messed up because I ain't not know what I got to be doing, yo. You go, you, are, you kind of understand because innately you can follow the nose. But we decided, no, can only do it once. And there's that very middle finger again. We're only allowed to use one negative in English. Two makes a positive. That was an art, a rule instigated. But Chaucer was famous for double negatives, famous for triple, quadruple negatives. But yet Chaucer, who I would consider the father of English literature, by, by Lowe's rules, two, three, four hundred years later, was wrong. You imagine some guy 300 years later, Chaucer, F. Your grammar sucks. <laughs> How do you? I'll write a poem about you. There once was a man named Loth. I really ducked it down Loth. Yeah, so, um, but he had his own language and he made English a literary language. So, I praise him. Um, and speaking of praise, there we go. Well, how can we have funny spellings in English then? Uh, take the word knight. I am talking the lad with the sword and doth fight and slay the dragon. How do you spell knight? Right. How do you pronounce it? How did you pronounce it originally? Knight. Knight. It is just like it was in the Monty Python skit. It was phonetic. Knight. Knight. Two things happen in the English language, very important for pronunciation and spelling. First thing that happened was this guy right here, William Caxton. Right, yeah, we're gonna pretend it's this guy here. He made the printing press, he made the printing press. And so he's got, this is back in the days before, um, what do you call them, computers. And um, they had to take blocks and set them on a big, Thing and make the spelling for every word. So the spelling for girl, for instance, was G-I-R-L, G-U-R-L, G-H-E-R-L-E, G-H-E-R-L-E-N, I think that was plural. Um, and there are about five different spellings. Yeah. So he's, sorry? Yeah. Uh, it, it could have been a whole, there was all these like, just throwing a bunch of letters, that was probably girl. Start with a K, probably start with a K at one point. And he said, enough, I got it. I, I got a deadline here, people. 5 p.m. next month. Uh, come on, hurry up. Uh, fine, I'm going to standardize the spelling. When I see the word girl, I'm going to change it. So thus began the first editing in English on print. And he said, okay, so girl, that's it. Easy for me, G-I-R-L. Well, Knigget was still Knigget. So he went Knigget. E was I back then. It was like Knigget. G H T. Knigget, there we go. K N I G H T. Knigget, done. Boom. Everything got standardized. So guess what? It wasn't Harvard. It wasn't Oxford. It was the printing press that solved that problem. Not quite. <laughs> then, right around then, so you got Chaucer's like, hey, look at me, Mom, I got a book, buy my book. And there's Chaucer doing book writing signings at Amazon or wherever the latest book. He's at Gilbo Books. <laughs> okay, maybe not Gilbo Book, maybe even not Am Were there bookstores back then? I don't think so, but they were making printing presses. They were making, they were making books. And um, then something happened around the same time called the Great Vowel Shift. <laughs> it's where we shifted all of our vowels. Uh, hopefully I zoom in on this one. Ah, there we go. So, uh, part, partly the reasons Canadians say do 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 boot it, part reason. <coughs> so, uh, kind of the, the really dumbed down version is all the vowels went up one spot. All, and then all the top vowels became diphthongs. So, ice, assuming we had the word back then, would have been ease. And then we said ice. And um, so back in the day, boot was boat. So if you had a boot, did you have a boot on? No, you had a boat on. And in my case, I actually have boats. They're pretty big. 
So back in the day, you'd say, "Ooh, we've got some nice boats there." And what? What? Oh, oh, you're not talking boat. You're talking kudu. Yeah. So kudu sounded like boat. And then after the vowel shift, everything shifted up one spot. So now we're gonna. This is where we start getting into some fun stuff. So pay attention. Um, so this all happened, and it all happened up the top, beat and bite. So when you bit somebody, and I go, oh, I got a bite from a dog. Like, I got a beat from a dog. A beat from a, I don't know. Beat from a dog. Was he in the garden taking beats like my like kimchi? What, what do you mean beat? Oh, bite, bite was beat before. So take the vowels, go down one, and that's your vowel shift. <laughs> So, we got standardized spelling and then the vowel shift. So, Kniget became, I guess, Kniget. And then, by normal convention in language, we just get lazy and we stop pronouncing things. So, it became Kniget. E became I, so night. That's where we got night instead of Kniget from. Oh, more on that. Uh, another way we come up with words is popular culture. Would you believe me if I said that? That we make words up based on things that are happening at the time. So the word for a police officer in England is often referred to as a bobby. A bobby. You know, what's the name bobby come from? Is you see your head is going, okay, got horses, but where does bobby come from? Well, the minister who founded the first official police departments in the world, the English will have you believe, but the first one in England was Robert Peel. And so his name is Robert Peel. Robert, Bob, Bobbert, Bobby. His boys, Bobbies. And that's where the name Bobby came from. 1828, where the word came from. 1828, the word Bobby appeared. So you might hear the English call somebody a Bobby, and they mean a police officer. Well, here's my other favorite one. Word in North America we use for police officers is copper. 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 Well, I thought copper doesn't copper. This is made of copper, right? Or tin or something? Mm -hmm. And tin geese. We'll talk about the tin. Uh, comes from the badge, right? It's made of tin, the copper, right? No. It comes from English, uh, Old French. It comes from the verb capé or caper, depending. Originally Latin, Latin, French, oh, there's the French again, came to England as capere, or capere was the Latin word, capere, which means to take, to take. Oh, watch out, here come the police. They're going to take something from you. They're going to cop it, cop a feel, cop a, cop a plea, take a plea, take something. And so that's where the word cop came from, cop. The slang means to take, cop. And it comes, depending where you... Again, we get the whole Franks, Saxons, it's, it's part Dutch, it's part French. Capere, capure, uh, caper, quaper, there's all these variations on the word, to take, to take. Not tin cap, I thought it meant tin. No, it means to take. Cops always taking away my stolen cars. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, another word we have for cops is, anyone know this movie? Fuzz, hot fuzz, fuzz, F-U-Z-Z. -Z. Where does the name fuzz come from? Well, here's another example of languages going back and forth. Okay. Uh, hot fuzz is an English movie. The word fuzz it originated in America. Um, there are many, many stories, but the bottom line, nobody really knows where it came from. Um, somebody started using it, they think, as early as the 1920s, gangsters using it. They don't really know why. Um, my personal belief, fuzz on their jacket. I don't know. Uh, the other ones people say it was their beards were fuzzy. There are many different ways, many different reasons. Um, so um, I'm going to leave that one there. And if you can find the answer, good on you. Um, not that transparent. So that word, English, went to, went to uh, America and came back. Just like the word hamburger. Hamburger comes from Hamburg. I'm from Hamburg. I'm a Hamburger. <laughs> no, you see a hamburger, you're expecting to see mm, cheese and bacon. No, I'm from Germany. Hamburger. Ich bin Hamburger. Um, 
on that same line, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy during the Berlin Airlift mm -hmm. stood up and said, Ich bin ein Berliner. Mm -hmm. Now, Berliner, I'm a Berliner, right? When you had Ein in front, uh, the Germans are fickly with their, their grammar. It means I, Berlina, like hamburger, is a food. Berlina is a donut with jelly in it, jelly donut. So instead of saying, I'm a Berliner, I'm from Berlin, you know, solidarity, yeah, you say, I'm a jelly donut. <laughs> so the Germans are like, oh, we get it, you're funny, but no. Yeah. Ich bin ein Berliner, I'm a jelly donut. Okay, so and that came back, that went to the States, and then went back to England. Oh, speaking of England, oh, I meant, you know, my title mentioned the word goose, didn't it? Geese, tin geese. Speaking of hot fuzz, there's two from the movie, Chasing a Goose. Why is it goose and geese, not goose and gooses? We've already established the plural is S, right? Should be gooses, right? Why is it mouse and mice? What's the plural of house? Heist? No. What's the plural of moose? Moose, yeah, a lot of people say, some people say moose is. Now there's a couple of reasons I'll talk about, the plurals in a second, but we'll talk about my favorite one, which is goose and geese. It's not, people say, well, it's Germans with it. Remember we talked about Hrossen and Hrossen, and they just switched the letters. No, it's not quite what happened. It's something called the Igutation. Yes, they were in the movie X-Men. They were mutants. And they had like extra hands. I'm going to change the way you say a word. Yeah. Um, okay, not quite. Started originally as basically the S, but back in the, those days, they didn't say S. They said, oh, don't, wrong one. Uh, uh, I can fix this. I want to fix this. I don't want to fix this. There we go. There we go. And go back. <laughs> there we go. Good. Now we're back. Phew. Um, go see. So they used to say with an I, not an S. That was the way they just stuck an I on the end of everything. But it didn't sound like go see back then. It sounded more like go see, go, go, oh. If you make the letter O, 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 and a little more, a little more open. So O, go, 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 goes okay. Go, go. Like I got. Gossy, gossy was the plural of goose, and goose was goss, goss, gossy, goss, gossy, goss, meet gossy, gossy, meet goss. Okay, so it was gossy, kind of like God. Okay, so gossy, and then we have something called fronting, which we still do today. Example. We talked about the Angles, Jutes, Frisians, Franks, and Saxons alike invading England. The word English comes from what? Angland. Angland or Angles. Yeah, that's right. They won that deal. <laughs> Angles and Saxons. I told you those back in the day, those Danes were some pretty mean dudes. So their name got to stick in England. English. It was Anglish. Anglish. Just like the word women. Why is it woman? But women, but it's spelled woman. Well, it's called fronting by nature. We're lazy with our letters. So we want to make them as close together as possible. So woman, woman became, and the it, woman became women. So this happens a lot. Just if you have some soju on you, you could do this now. Get really drunk and then start saying your vowels, and you'll notice that they get all mixed up. Uh, and that's what happens. Your tongue just starts losing control. And it was originally woman. And then it became women. The tongue loosens up and everyone's speaking fast. And it, that's how it changes. So we went from gossy to the fronting. Now this is an interesting letter. Uh, we we uh, eventually end up with this, this tilde through it. And it's kind of uh, good, uh, uh, uh. Uh, it's a rounding, uh, uh, uh. and when you get rid of the rounding, uh, uh, uh. so when you think of ew, think of ew, ew, uh, 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 uh. Yeah, try that, uh. that's called rounding, when your lips get tight, uh. your 
tongue, your whole mouth is the same except your lips changing. <coughs> so it's Gersi, 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 Gersi. Somewhere around there, Gersi. Well, the English got rid of that. They're like, that sounds really weird, and you're Danish, and we hate you now. So we're just not going to round our vowels anymore. So Ger, again, probably too much to drink, loosened that up and went from Ger to Ger, Ger, Ger. Guessy, guessy, guessy. And then what happens? Well, we got rid of the I completely and dropped it. So we got rid of that. It was still guess, and then it became guess. And a after the vowel shift became gee. Up one a geese. Ah. So it went through one, two, three, four, five different things happened to the word goose. And that's why we have geese. It's kind of like when you go to the uh, the eye doctor, and he's got the things on it. He goes number one or number two. Number one, number two. I see number one again. Number one, number two. Number two. Okay. Number one. Now number one is now number two. Number two. Sorry. Number one. Number two. Number two. Number three. Number three. Number four. Number four. Number, four, number, four, number five. And then you're like. What was number one again? That's <laughs> exactly what happened to the word goose. And mouse is exactly the same. So why is it moose and not and moose and moose and not moose and mice? Well, that would really mess things up. But it's moose and moose because two trains of thought. Moose when you is not an English word. It's Amerindian or Native Canadian American. Uh, comes from, I believe, uh, ba -ba 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 Ojib Ojibwe, Oja Onondaga. It's from the Ontario region of Canada. Yeah, it's around that area, uh, Mohawkish area. So the guys run around with the hair, like just the hair on top, with nothing on the sides. They're the ones that had the word moose. So they were talking with the Canadians, or the sorry, would have been the French and the um, the English, and they're like, what is that big animal there with the big nose? In a big hole. The antlers. Eh. Moose. A what? Moose. Oh, moose. And then we just, whenever we pluralize a foreign word, we do one of two things. We just leave it. So moose and moose. Or we just put an S on it. So is it noribong or noribongs? <coughs> I went to three noribongs last night or I went to three noribong last night? I don't know. Kind of, we just sort of figure out either it's plural with an S or not. I come from the, the belief that you shouldn't put the S on, but I think speaking, we just naturally, there's the rule, book, books, S, okay. So that's how we end up with moose and moose instead of moose and mooses or moose and mice, mouse and mice, mouse and mice, oh, poor mouse. Now what about our friend the octopus? What about this guy? What's the plural of octopus? Octopus. Octopi. It's not octopi. <laughs> I believed it was octopi till about right before I moved to Korea. And I had a Greek friend of mine who just incensed him. Hey, it's not octopi, it's octopodus. What? Octopodes, octopodus, whatever. What? What? Octo is Latin and Greek. Both. But pus is Greek. Head is Latin. So we always get confused because we add up the you know, Latin, 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 Greek, 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 Latin, Greek, Latin, Greek, 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 Latin. And often they're the same word because they too mixed a lot. So I, I could give you a rule of thumb. Well, body parts are all Latin. And all sporting events are Greek. But I'd be wrong. So it's pentathlon, um, octuplets, I don't know. But I could mix them up. I can't give you a solid rule, but I can tell you, pus is Greek. Therefore, the plural is octopodes. Octopodes, or octopodos, tomato, tomato, which I'll get to in a second, tomato. But uh, it's octopodos or octopodes, and thus eight grapes. If you take that in Korean, eight, and podos gives you what? Palpodos, eight. Eight grapes, octopodos, P O D O E S. Uh, nowadays they do it with an E, P -I D E S, P O D E S, octopodes, octopodes. 
Try that for a second. Just take that for a spin. Octopodes. Now, how pretentious would you sound? It's already pretentious, and I'm so smart when you say it's octopi, as I did. And the actual word is not pretentious, it's pedantic. You think you're smarter than you really are. And then you go, oh, it's octopi, as I did. And I am pedantic and pretentious, and I'm arrogant and condescending. So it's a horrible mix of all those words. And you know that, don't you? <laughs> so, uh, about me. So uh, that is actually octopodes. But nobody would ever look at you and say, oh my god, I, you're, you're right, and I'm wrong now. So what has become convention is octopuses. We talk about moose and mooses. So we took a lot of these words, particularly the old words, and stuck an S on them. The Greek words, the Latin words. So it's octopuses. So officially now the correct way is <coughs> octopuses or octopodes. But if you believe it was octopi. And so is that rhinoceri? What's the plural of rhinoceros? It's rhinoceros, because it's already in the plural form, rhinoceros, that's it. If you want to say rhinoceri, it's rhinoceros, uh, it becomes rhinocer, rhinocero, rhinocerati, I think, rhinocerati, um, changes, it's a different ending in Latin. So, um, just stick with rhinoceros and octopuses and everyone will be happy, I think, I hope. So that's our friend the octopus. Um, then we got little things with accents. I'm going to some slang, some American slang. We're going to take turns and we'll see uh, how much you know and how much I know. Okay. okay? Uh, the first one I'm going to give you is uh, flossing. You know what flossing means? <laughs> you mean actually flossing? No, it's right. slang. It's slang. Uh, you, I mean, you do know what actual flossing is. Well, I know. Uh, <laughs> I know the American's opinion of British uh, dental practice, but yes, I do. Uh -huh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Flossing. That would be something close fitting, and uh, no, I know, I don't know. No. Oh, there's. That would be. That was to really show you how wrong you were. <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah, it really is. It was aggressive. I'm yeah. sorry, because I could have just said no, but we right. just. In America, we like to really rub it in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it's showing off, flossing. Really? Yeah, showing off is flossing. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> What sound does it make when you're right? It's, it's, it's both. Like um, that, yeah. <laughs> it just, um, it's probably a different sound in England. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I've never um, Chinwag. Chinwag. Never going to say it again. Okay. Chinwag. Yeah. Uh, she's thinking shin. That would be a, a, a blundering idiot. A shinwag. You shinwag. <laughs> no? No, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a verb, and it means to chat. It, it's literally to wag your chin. It's actually very literal, it's not really... Shinwag. Chin, chin, chinwag. Did chin. I mispronounce it? I think that's why I never would have gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't understand the thick British accent. Can you accent. look at that in slow motion? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, chinwag, of course. Yes. That does sound like... Alright. So we're tied. Uh, yes. I did nothing. Um, uh, <laughs> Means to pass someone on a motorcycle, then see a police car and break. It's an extremely curvaceous female behind. Right. We definitely don't have those. You don't have it? Badonkadonk. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great? You use it now. I enjoy your badonkadonk, honey. <laughs> All right. That's fantastic. Chuffed to bits. Chuffed, Chuffed to bits. Chuffed to bits. Chuffed. Chuffed. Yeah. Like chin. Yes. <laughs> Chuffed right. to bits. Yeah. Um, uh, just, uh, oh, just exhausted. Uh, oh. No, no, it's it's to be really pleased, to be really pleased about, to be thrilled by something. I'm chuffed to bits. That's what I meant. I'm delighted. Um, <laughs> and uh, chuffed to bits by... <laughs> I, would be, I would be chuffed to bits by all the donkey dogs. Uh, <laughs> not everyone on this one, because everyone has learned this watching the show, because um, I've helped them. Shoddy. 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 
Examples of you could call it ebonics, but slang, slang. Uh, but donkey donk originated uh, maybe 2001, from what I found, and it has a description. Um, it has been described uh, uh, by uh, Tracy Morgan, an American uh, uh, comedian, and he said he's a big, a nice big butt goes bud donk donk. <laughs> so that's where the that's where the saying comes from, apparently, and. Uh, uh, there's the other ones, uh, but they all come from some sort of slang representation. Shorty probably probably came from shorty, shorty, uh, and then it branched off. So a short person was is called shorty, and depending on your dialect, it became shoddy. But then the sounds like that they made fun of the Northern American accent, shoddy, kind of more like. Um, is that New York? New England. New England, sorry, New England. Um, I didn't want to mention it's still too soon after Boston. So, um, and they <laughs> went with shoddy and kind of, and then it became an attractive young girl. Um, right. Uh, now, what about, what about how we say our words? I, I think that uh, we have to be constantly asking ourselves, how do we calculate the risk? Please answer the question yes or no. Would you have relations with that man? Not if I not if I could avoid it. <laughs> no, I think it would. <laughs> um, so uh, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton is very famous for her O's, the letter O. She doesn't say O, she says ah, ah. And that's another vowel shift that's happening in English, particularly in America, and it's called the Northern Cities Vowel Shift. We're talking like New England, New York, uh, even uh, Chicago, Chicago's got some very interesting accents. And they're changing their vowels. Um, bus in Chicago is now boss. Um, uh, bath is not bath, it's bath. And they're switching the vowels, they're changing the vowels. So how does that happen? Well, it happens like right now. Uh, people meet. And from a socio sociology perspective, sociological perspective, we imitate each other. We watch birds and dogs and monkeys when they're together, they start shadowing each other's behaviors. They mimic each other. So your accent, the way you talk, you start mimicking the people around you. So I'm from Canada. Um, I come to, to, to Korea. I hang out with some English people, some Americans, some Australians, and all of our accents kind of mishmash. So the people with really strong accents start neutralizing or coming towards the center. Then what happens? They go home. They go home and they have this new accent. And their friends are like, man, you sound strange. Where you've been hanging out with them people up there? And they're like, well, yes, I have. And I like the way they talk. Well, you sound smart now. Uh, thank you. I'm going to start talking like you. And then friends mimic, mimic, mimic. And then more mimic, mimic, mimic. And that's how accents change. Um, that's my theory. Um, there are other theories as well. Um, but that's the belief I have in how words then change. And we go from Knigget to Knight. And the vowels change. And over time, the way we pronounce words change. The words we use change. Um, oh, good one. South Africa. The word in South Africa, actually I'll give you the scenario. I went to the World Cup in 2010 and I said, um, I need to go to the pharmacy and get some, I don't know, cough syrup. I had a sore throat or something. And um, I was staying at a hostel and the lady said, oh, we've got to go down the road and when you get to the robot, go through the robot, it's on the right hand side. Through the robot? What the? Ro you have robots? That, on, 
<coughs> right, you're not from Africa, are you? Robot is a traffic light, a traffic light, red, yellow, green, yeah? So that's the word they use for traffic light. Now, every once in a while, I'll say robot. That, those words from your <coughs> friends get tossed in the language. Hamburger, um, Bobby, Fuzz, these words all get mixed up and your friends take your words and you mix them up and they go back and they mix them with their friends. And that's how we get language change. Because humans are animals and animals are social. Which brings us back to my final point. This is the universe. Well, that's the Earth. And we're all, in essence, kind of the same, but different. That's it.